Hi everyone, my name is Alex and welcome to the service today. We're so happy that you joined us and if you want to know what we're up to, be sure to follow us on Instagram at HubChurchNY but most importantly, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and turn on your notifications so that you never miss an upload from us. Enjoy today's service. Uh, we started a sermon series uh, last week about rebuilding uh, your life and today the, the title of the sermon is Heart to Heart. Last week we began, and I know sometimes it may seem like a kind of a daunting task, but I, I, I don't want you to check out because you think that it's too much for you to rebuild yourself. Stay with me, and I assure you that God will help us all through this, and He'll do what He wants in our lives. Uh, we are approaching the whole process through the blueprint given to us in the book of Nehemiah. So we're going to use that as kind of our blueprint for how we do this. We have to remember, though, that in this walk as a Christian, it is not a sprint. It's a marathon, right? And so you can't expect everything to change in your life immediately. It takes time. We all have probably dabbled uh, with jigsaw puzzles. Anybody ever done jigsaw puzzles? Amen? Uh, there's nothing more frustrating to me than to get to the end of the jigsaw puzzle and someone has done it before me and they lost a couple pieces. And you, you look at it and you, you, can't, you, know, you, you can't enjoy the whole picture because there's something missing. And, and uh, you know, it's funny how that happens. When, when you do have a picture where a piece is missing, that's the only thing your eye goes to is where that spot is, where it's missing. And, and I think um, I've also watched, watched the frustration of people uh, who want to see the whole picture of God's purpose in their life, but don't understand how the pieces of their personal life, they, how they all fit together. And most Christians don't know the difference between their spirit and their soul. And the distinction between spirit and soul are very clear. They're, they're, they're different. And, and uh, we'll see it in Scripture, you know. The distinction between spirit and soul are just as clear as the difference between the walls in the book of Nehemiah of the city of Jerusalem and the, the temple. And so there's, there's differences. It's like saying uh, that the rebuilt temple made the rebuilding of the walls unnecessary when we look at it, and that's not the case. Likewise, I think it's super important for us to know the distinctions between the soul and spirit to know how to respond to God's work in our lives. The Bible makes a clear distinction between our soul and our spirit. And if you look at Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, it states this, For the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Also in First Thessalonians, we see what Paul wrote, and Paul said, he prayed for the Thessalonians, said, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit soul and body be preserved blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible not only distinguishes between man's spirit and soul, but says that the Word of God, it really discerns between them. That is, it teaches us the difference to avoid confusion about them. Let's take a look at, at the map of the city. If you can throw that up, the, the map of the city of Jerusalem now, you can see here what we've got. And if you look at the map, you see where the walls are and the gates are, and you can see where the temple is. And, and the temple is kind of central to the, to the whole city, to the whole central area of the city. And that, that really does represent... Uh, our spirit. You know, it's when the temple was rebuilt, it was that, that aspect of worship that was restored. And we can make the comparison to that, to our inner man and our spirit man. If you go to the next diagram, you can see this. You can see that when we are, were born, thank you, Adam and Eve, there is, there is this separation between us and God because sin entered into the world. And so when sin enters the world, it basically severs our spirit man from God. And so our spirit man is basically dead. But then what happens when we come to Christ and we give our heart to Jesus and we're born again, that's where the cross is here and we're restored. Our spirit man again is made alive and restored. And so we have this, this state where now my spirit man is made alive. 
He was dead, but now he's alive. And, and so when we're born again by asking Jesus into our lives, that's what happens. We get that restored. And again, looking at the map of the city, the walls of the city, you can go back to that previous one if you could. The, you can see the walls of the city, and the walls of the city are, are inside the, of the valley, the valley of Kinnam and the, the valley of Kidron. And, on, and what it is is that the walls are basically central to that area of the world. And the walls, again, they represent our soul. They represent that, that part of our being called our soul. And then on the outside, the valley of, of Hinnom and the valley of Kidron, those are places where there was supposed to be fruitfulness in our lives. And that truly does represent our physical bodies. Again, you know, the, the comparison of these areas can represent our human body, and it can manifest kingdom witness, or it can manifest actions that violate or contradict his purposes. Let's go to Nehemiah now, the book of Nehemiah, chapter 1 and verse 4, and I want you to look at this, and it says, So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. See, Nehemiah's concern was that the walls of the city remained broken long after the temple had been rebuilt and had been restored. And the concern over the walls was really, it represents that, that whole aspect of our soul for us to, to have our souls restored. Even though we've been born again, God is still interested in working out those things in our souls that need changing or rebuilding. For many, that process stops when it, when it becomes too painful or there's just no path that they can see to accomplish the rebuilding necessary. And this is what Paul is referring to in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. If you could throw that up and it says, and do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. He made this plea to those that had been recently born again or had recently saved uh, to a change from their former pattern of living. And I will say this, that there are, there are some Christians that want to use the title of Christian until God requests us to stop doing something that was a part of our, our past and, and is, is maybe in an accepted practice of the world, but is displeasing to Kim. I, I, I will be honest, it isn't necessarily sin all the time. I remember when the Lord put a demand on me, and it was to give up watching television so much. And it wasn't that television was sin or that I was even watching things that were bad but it was that God wanted more time with me. He wanted more time with me in His Word, more time with me worshiping Him, more time with me in His presence. And so I, I had a choice to make, and it was whether or not I was going to say yes to the Lord and, and give up television, or not give it up completely, but give it up to some degree. And, and so it, it's those processes that God is interested in. I know that this begins to sometimes meddle with our lifestyle, but that is what dealing with our soul is all about, dealing with those things that are a part of our destructive behavior. You know, that, that destructive behavior may be something God sees as destructive for me, not necessarily to what others will see, but what God looks at, and he goes, okay, that's, that's okay for them because it doesn't affect them, but it's not okay for you, so I need you to stop that. And so I have to be careful not to put what God says to me on others because God may be speaking something specific to me that I need to deal with that is not an issue for Brian or Lori or Jenny or you. You know, but he may be speaking to me about something. Certainly there are obvious things that completely are in violation of God's Word, but not everything that he asks me to let go of is sin or something that he may, may require of you. Uh, Paul is saying that there should be something different, though, about our life. If we call ourselves Christians and the process of, of breaking those things off of our soul uh, that are holding us captive is the whole process of rebuilding our lives. It's getting rid of the worldly views that have been a part of our normal thinking prior to being born again. And it is no coincidence that, that the walls which caused Nehemiah's tears 
uh, it, it, that, that they're, bro they're broken. And it represents our soul that can cause the Holy Spirit to grieve. Nehemiah was grieved over the broken walls. And the Holy Spirit is certainly grieved over those things that, that are broken in our own lives. And he wants restored. He wants rebuilt. When our spirit is reborn, our bodies are subject to our direction. Okay? Our soul then determines what our new life will be. It sits in the driver's seat. Your soul sits in the driver's seat. And if it is dysfunctional because of past habits or pain or needed repair or iniquities, the whole person is affected. It affects you. We are all part of the body of Christ, and we need each other. And when, when we have an area that needs repair, it affects the whole body. It does. This is where small groups have the ability to bring about change in our souls. That's why it's so important for us to be involved with each other because someone may, may say something that triggers something in your heart and says, you know what, I guess I, I need to deal with that. I need to deal with that issue in my life. And, and God may use individuals in these small groups to point things to you. And, and, and I think that's, that's so important for us. The, 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 the work of the ministry of, of being coming what Jesus wants us to be, becoming more like Him, is the process of us growing together. It's growing up into what He's called me to be. And so in order for me to grow up into what God's called me to be, sometimes I need the interaction of my brothers and sisters to help me see it. I'm afraid, though, that in the church it has not been dealt with those issues very well in the past. In the past, there was something that there was something that needed to be dealt with an individual. There was something in their heart or in their life that was sin. Uh, the church had basically two methods of dealing with it, and one was abruptly telling them, "You know, you need to stop this." And, and, and really, it made them feel like they were second-class Christians, that there was something, you know, that they, they were defective, and, and that's not the case at all. You know, for most of us, we want to do what's right in God's eyes. You know, the Spirit of God is inside of you. When you give your heart to Jesus, He's inside of you, and He's working on you, and we desire to be what God wants us to be. But if there's no explanation of, of why change is needed from those that are bringing it to you, then, you know, if it's not given in the, in the, in a, with a mindset of love or with reaching out to you with, with helpful ideas and attitudes, then it creates what we call a cur current term that the church uses, and that is church hurt. And, and, and I know there's many, maybe some even here, that have dealt with church hurt. You know, when harsh treatment is the method, it almost always ends in offense. And the, and the whole process of soul health and what God wants to do and accomplish in you becomes short-circuited because of the offense and because so many just leave the church after the offense because they've been dealt with incorrectly. And another way that the church de dealt with it was, the second method was to ignore the si situation until it became an issue that had permeated the whole body, the whole church, and it, it overwhelmed it because it accepted something that displeased God. And perhaps a modern-day example of this is where some denominations are now, you know, considering or even accepting the LBGTQ lifestyle as okay in the sight of God, and His Word clearly defines it as sin. Hear me, we, we, it's not that we don't love the sinner. We love the sinner. We just don't love the sin. But by endorsing everything that is sin but is common to a generation, we are choosing popular culture over God. And we can't do that because God's Word doesn't change. And it doesn't, doesn't just because our culture has accepted something doesn't mean that God's Word has changed it all. We see examples of this addressed in the book of Revelation. What John says, shows it with the seven churches that he addresses. They had issues. All except for one had issues that the church failed to deal with. And God had issue with them. And he, he made it very clear. Uh, at the seat of our identity, though, is and the will, the soul function as the common center of our life. What goes on there will determine to what extent the king's rule will manifest in the whole of our being. So what happens in my soul, it controls how much the king has rule over my life. If there's a malfunction there, it may, may not mean that we're headed for hell, 
but it does cause the Holy Spirit dismay or distress. It does. Now let's take, let me just take a, a little closer look at the soul and how it works. The things that make up our personally, personality. So we have, number one, our intellect. And this is the process of your intelligence or your mind or your thoughts or the lack thereof. You know, in my case, you know, I, I'm accused of that at times. But it, it is that part of our, our being, that, of our soul, that, that processes things. And then there's our emotions, the process of your temperament, your feelings, or your attitude. And then there's our will, the process of your choices, how you make decisions. Most of what attracts or lures or drives or convinces or persuades us or motivates us is generated through our thought, our intellect, and through our emotions at, at, at that our feelings, our emotional level. The thing that is affected by the interaction of our, of our, our intellect and our emotions is our will, the decision-making center of your soul. The human will is the most awesome part of your soul. It determines your destiny. What goes on in my soul determines how I feel today, my emotions, or what goes on in my, in my, in my, my will, in my soul, decides if I will learn today, my, my intellect. My will determines if I need to respond or reject thoughts and feelings that may or may not be pleasing to God. That's where it happens. My will has to, to expand, it, it has to respond to those things. And those responses can either make my problem larger or it can take me to progress over an issue in my life. It can. We may be, may be deep thinkers or highly emotional individuals. The rebuilding of our soul removes the dominance of one area, area and balances our lives. It really does. Have you ever met somebody that was a super emotional person and everything was drama, drama you know, everything was dramatic in their life? Or that person that they were a deep thinker and you'd say something and, man, they'd go away and they'd process it and process it and process it. And, and it made it difficult for them to make decisions because they were still processing. And those that were emotionally all over the place, it was difficult, difficult for them to get balance in their life because everything that had affected their emotions made them change their mind about something. And that's where God wants to bring balance into our lives in that aspect so that our soul is, is controlling us, but it is making decisions for us, but it's balanced. You know, the, 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 the presence of God will come in. The born-again spirit determines my worship, and my rebuilt soul determines my service to God. The absolute coolest thing in all of this is that the Holy Spirit is moved with an understanding of what I really need. And there is, uh, there's help for me to overcome and bring that balance to my soul. It is there. The Holy Spirit, we're all different. All of us are different. You know, I respond differently than my wife does to things. And we, we, we're all different, but the Holy Spirit knows exactly what you need to become what He desires you to become. That's what the whole object here is for my soul to get healthy enough so that my will is making the right decisions and I become what God wants me to become. And, and certainly, the whole process of being born again is part of it, but it's the rebuilding of my soul, of my life, that makes me into what God wants me to be. Likewise, a broken wall leaves no line of defense. Often we've, you know, it, it, when you have uh, something that has occurred in your life, perhaps at an early age, it may leave insecurities in your life. But, and, and it may be that there's a broken wall there now because of that, that, that insecurity. In the same way, broken personal uh, walls hinder our mind from resisting unwanted ideas and cripple us. And because of the strength of emotions to be courageous in times of, of crisis. And so it is that whole process or a broken wall can cause some of us to become paralyzed because I have to think every possible avenue through and, and it keeps me from making any decision at all. So why don't I seem to be able to resist temptation? Could the reason be that crumbled walls and burned gates mean there's no line of defense against these things? 
That's possible, right? It's probable. Perhaps my personality is spongy because, you know, it's, there's, it's not solidly fixed on a wall, and so uh, I'm overcome with doubt or by habits easily. How often does my imagination hinder me to the point that it interferes with where I really want to go? I begin, the, the, you know, I begin to believe the lies that the enemy may whisper in my ear, like, you know, you can't do that. You, you're not able to do that. And, and when we start to entertain those things, it, it can hinder us. The great news is that our spirit loves God. And when you are born again, and because of that, God's restoration its process is included in redemption. The process of, of, of that whole soul health is included in redemption. It's kind of like finding out that the manufacturer's warranty is in place over your broken dishwasher. They made provision for a whole year. You know, how many of you know that God's provision, His warranty is forever? There is no one-year warranty on whether or not you're going to get you're restored or you're rebuilt. He has a plan for your life and will fulfill it if we welcome the Holy Spirit and give ourselves completely to the work He wants to accomplish, accomplish in us. And it is forever. Amen. Amen. In the whole process, I realized in my own journey to rebuilding which, by the way, is ongoing. It is still ongoing. That prayer, prayer, prayer was a vital part of the rebuilding process. If you look at Nehemiah 1, verses 4 to 11, which I'm not going to read, but if you open up your, your smartphone or something to look at it, you see the heart of Nehemiah and how he even approached this whole process or issue of rebuilding. His prayer set the tone. The truth and the thrust of the kind of prayer the Holy Spirit assists believers in making. The Holy Spirit wants to help us to pray and help us in this whole process of rebuilding. The starting point, though, is the commitment to pray. Then there are these questions that we all have to deal with. What can I pray for or about? When should I pray? How can I pray God's will? I don't want to be presumptuous, you know? How can I be sure I'm not you know, praying selfishly. There is an attitude that I, I want you to, to really avoid, and that is maybe things will work out anyway. And, and, and when we have that kind of uncertainty, it makes us look at why should I bother praying at all. And in reading Nehemiah's prayer, we can learn a lot. It restored a city, so it was effective. You know, so contrary to many people's ideas, prayer is not another kind of work. It is not. You don't earn points with God or gain His attention or favor through your human effort. That's not it. Getting God to restore His divine plan for your soul is not a reward in response to a certain quantity of prayer. Oh, if I spend five hours in prayer each day, then God's going to restore or rebuild my life. Prayer is not a works program. It is not. Prayer develops my relationship with God. It does not earn me brownie points, okay? It develops my relationship with God. I learn more about God's person, and I discover His nature infusing mine. So when I spend time with God, I, I have this, this, this whole process that goes on. I start to know His heart, and He starts to know my heart. Thus the title of the sermon, Heart to Heart. I find healing in His presence. I understand more about myself and why I am with Him. It compels me to, to search my own heart and motives and, and thoughts. And this is where the title of today's sermon comes from, is it's my heart that He's interested in. God is interested in your heart. It's not all about my actions. Yes, God does want us to change the way that we function, but He's more interested in my heart. I learn the most about God when I'm before His throne in prayer. And I learn the most about me when I'm with Him. I learn the most about me. When I spend time in that place, it settles my confidence in His ability to meet every one 
of my needs. It does. I get subtle in it. It helps me to see that he is great and big, but also within an earshot of my weakest cry. God is big. He's huge. He created this whole universe and beyond. But he's not too far that he doesn't hear the cry of my weakest, weakest cry to him. Look at Nehemiah 1.5. It says, Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commands. In this we see that there is a pretty close relationship with loving God and obeying him. We see it in, in, in John's epistles as well. It says, if you love me, you'll obey me. You'll follow my commandments. And we have a covenant with God. It's not that Nehemiah was perfect in obedience. He wasn't. If you look at his prayer, he started out, first of all, with repentance. So we see it in his re repentance, but he prayed with a heart of obedience, and God answered him. It, it, many approach rebuilding from the mindset that my present failures guarantee that God will never be able to accomplish his purposes in my life because perfect obedience is not possible in me. I can't do it. So there's no chance that I'll ever be able to be made whole in this aspect of my soul. It's the link, though, of this prayer of the heart and the desire to obey, not necessarily perfect obedience. What counts more is what I want, not what I am. Okay? 1 Samuel and first six, in chapter 16, verse 7 says this, The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The praying heart is intent on obedience. It may not immediately experience victory in those areas of our soul that we're looking for help in, but God is set to respond to us according to our heart's desire. He'll help you. In other words, it, it, it may not look like I'm accomplishing much in the victory over a particular area or sin or something in my life, but when your heart is right and you desire it and you continue to come before God, God will look at you and will say, I see their heart. I see your heart, and here's my response. I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you overcome this thing that, that so easily besets you. And we see it all through Scripture where God does that. The praying heart that is intent on obedience may not immediately experience victory. But God will hear the cry when your heart is right. Prayer should always be grounded in our understanding of the Word of God. Nehemiah's prayer begins with confession. We have read and in Nehemiah 1.7. It says, We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. That was Nehemiah 1.7. For God's will to be realized in my life rather than my own way which has been corrupted by my, my unregenerated soul, I need to be sensitized to my sin. I need to be. When I confess my sin, the Holy Spirit will help me become, number one, unhooked from the clutching power of my past sins and unharnessed from sins that would seek to find expression through me now. We have all been damaged enough by sin's impact. It's time to confess that we per what we perceive as sin according to God's Word and ask for Holy Spirit's insight to see more clearly what sins are still present, what things are still there, what things I still need to repent of. There's things that God is still dealing with in my life. I've been saved over 50 years, and God still puts his finger. Whenever I go to fasting and prayer, I get in his presence, and God will put his finger on something in my life and say, hey, you know what? You need to deal with this. This is something that I want to change in your life. And that's when I bring it before, the, before God and I, I, I get my heart right before the Holy Spirit. And I say, Holy Spirit, you see my desire. You see my desire to serve you and to, to do it right, but you've got to change my will because my will is, is not working right. My will is still stuck with this whole aspect of, of this particular thing in my life, and I need to get over it. I need your help, Holy Spirit. And when our heart is right, that's when the Holy Spirit will come in and he'll say, hey, you know what? Let me come alongside you. Let me join hands with you. Let me, let me lock arms with you, and I'll help you through this whole process so that you can gain victory. 
because the victory was won at Calvary. And we can all have victory over anything in our lives if we come before God and ask Him with a heart that wants what God wants for us. And it, that's, it's, it's not always easy. It's not necessarily easy to overcome the things of our past. You know, we, we all have a history. And when it is there, the Holy Spirit, when we see it, the Holy Spirit can bring it to our mind and, and it can help us pray rather than us coming up with some humanistic idea to deal with it. We can allow the Holy Spirit to come and help us. Praying according to the promises of the Word reminds us that it is His nature to be good, loving, and merciful. And I'm, I'm afraid that the, the nature of this world has crept into us, even in dealing with ourselves sometimes. And, and mercy is not necessarily the way of the world. And, and sometimes we're not very merciful towards ourselves. You know, God... God says that I will extend my hands of grace and my mercy toward you. And sometimes we, we, we hang ourselves out to dry because we failed. I've tried. I've, I've not been able to overcome this. And, 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 and we are the ones that are, are killing ourselves because we've said there's no way I'll ever accomplish this. No way I'll ever overcome this. And, and the, the challenge is me getting over myself, you know. When we put these truths into, to, into our heart, we'll find that faith necessary to pray through these things will happen. But it's important. This is the key. If I'm going to uh, allow the Holy Spirit to bring something up in my heart, a, a, a scripture or a, a verse or some story in the Bible, then it's got to be in there. If it's not in there, then the Holy Spirit's not going to be able to bring it up and help you to be over, overcomers. That's why it's so important for us to get the Word into ourselves, to make sure that we're spending time uh, reading God's Word and praying over it and allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to us through it. But it's through that process that we are able to overcome because the Holy Spirit will then remind us of a particular Scripture or something that will help us to overcome. Look at what the prophet Jeremiah says. I, I love this in Jeremiah 29. It says, Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me. When you search for me with all your heart, I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I've driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you to the place from which I cause you to be carried away captive. God wants us to be restored, and he says that he will hear us when we pry out, when we pray. Rebuilding our life is done from a stance on our knees, and the Holy Spirit will assist you in doing so. It is that process. The rebuilding process will involve your complete partnership with Him. And prayer is the foundational meeting place for that partnering. That's where I partner with God, is spending time in prayer and, and seeking His face. He won't do the job for you, but is present to help the task to be accomplished in you. You know, even as Nehemiah was there, he was the one that directed them how to rebuild the wall. He didn't do the work all for them. He helped them. He showed them. And he, he fought off the enemy's attacks. But he was there to give direction and leadership. And the Holy Spirit is there in your life to give you direction and leadership to overcome. The, the rebuilding process will involve our partnership with Him. He won't do the job for you, but is present to help the task to be accomplished. It, you know, it's not hard for us, for those of you that, that work in, in the world and have a job where maybe you have projects that you have to work on. I know, I know Brian, you're always working on projects. And so it's easy for us to see that we have to have meetings on a continual basis with those that are involved in the project to be able to get the project to completion. We have to recognize that if we're going to see the project to completion, we need to spend time with God. You know, and the project is you. You're the project. I'm the project. And the, the, the way that I'm going to see this project through is for me to have regular interaction 
with God and with the Holy Spirit and Him speaking into my heart and into those situations that I know I've dealt with for years, but God says, now's my time. Now is when I'm going to bring you through that. Come on and stand with me today. It's about the heart. God wants your heart. He's, he's, about, he's interested in every aspect of your life, but He's interested mostly in your heart. Where's your heart at? Do you desire the things of God? Do you want to live for Him? Do you want to walk for Him? Do you want to serve Him? And the way that, that we come to that place of acknowledging that is, first of all, inviting Him into our heart. If you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, then you're never going to know that there is sin in your life. You know, the Holy Spirit will open your eyes to that sin. And when we come to that place of saying, God, I need you, I, I, I'm, I realize that this is a part of my uh, life, and I know that I've messed it up so many times, and I need your help to get me on the right pathway. And it starts with me asking Jesus Christ to be my Lord, not just my Savior, but my Lord. He is my Savior because He died on the cross for me. He took all of my sins on the cross of Calvary. And, and, but it is not just being my Savior. It's being my Lord. That means I surrender to Him. I say, Lord, here I am. I'm yours. Use me any way that you want. And if you're here or you're watching online and you've never, never asked Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life, to come in and be your Savior, but also to be your Lord, I want to give you that opportunity today. Maybe you've, you've done it before, but you've been in a backslidden state. You've not, you've not re been walking with God recently, and you need to recommit and, and to make this, this a real deal where you say, God, I'm giving my life to you. I want to pray for you today. So if that's you, if you're here or you're online, I want you just to join along with me in this prayer. We're all going to pray it together. And we're going to believe that God's going to touch your heart. Let's just pray this together. Lord Jesus, I know that you, I'm a sinner. And I know that I need a Savior. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying on that cross for me, for taking all of my sins and making me clean. I thank you, Lord that when God looks at me, He looks at me through your blood and through the cross. I give my life to you now, Lord. I accept you into my heart, and I ask you, Lord, to be my Lord. I surrender to you in Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer, we've got some great material here that will help you in your walk with Christ. If you're watching online, I'd love for you to, to, to just connect with us and we'll send it out to you. If you're here, just come and see myself or my wife or Pastor Jenny after service and we'll get that to you. We just want you to become all that God wants you to be. Amen? I believe that God's got something great in store for each and every one of us. It doesn't matter if you're 15 or 5 or 95. God's got a plan for your life. He's got a purpose for your life. He has a destiny for you. And I believe with all my heart that if you're still breathing and you're still alive, then He's got something for you to do. He does. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.